It was a great picnic, but I just wasn't having much fun. Every year, our company head hosted a gathering at his home for all the employees. There was plenty of food and drinks and fun activities for the kids. My co-workers were gathered around one table, and their wives were sitting together at other tables. I guess I just wasn't in a party mood. My name is Marty Sanders, and I've been with the same company for ten years. I married my wife Marcy right after we graduated from college. It was a typical romance, and getting married felt like the natural next step. I wanted lots of kids, but Marcy wasn't interested in motherhood. I thought everything was fine with our relationship until a few weeks ago when I started noticing the signs. At first, I thought I was imagining things and tried to stay calm about it. However, the little things that bothered me didn't go away, and I finally decided I had to verify her infidelity or put it to rest. Wednesdays seemed significant, so that became my target day for investigating. I went to work as usual that morning, but before leaving, I placed my GPS on the back floor of Marcy's BMW. I turned off the auto shutdown and installed fresh batteries that would last a minimum of 14 hours. Work went as usual, except I left a few hours early and swung by the house. Her car was there, so I parked down the street, went back, and retrieved the GPS from the back seat. It worked perfectly. She had left the house, and I had a clear track of where she went. I set the unit on the center console and embarked on my little treasure hunt. About 20 minutes later, I found myself in the airport Holiday Inn parking lot. The hotel front desk attendant seemed friendly enough. I mentioned that my wife had been there earlier for a business meeting and had left a pair of expensive sunglasses in the room. I asked if he could check the lost and found, but I didn't know the room number. Taking a long shot, I gave him her name and asked which room she had rented. He gave me a strange look and a small smile as he checked the computer. He said she had been in room 417 and had checked out around 2 p.m. The room hadn't been cleaned yet, but he suggested I check with the maid who was working on that floor. I thanked him with a 20 and went to find the maid. The maid was as accommodating as the desk clerk, and another 20 got me into the room without any problem. There wasn't much of interest in the room, just dirty sheets, wet towels, and three used condoms in the trash can. I took the condoms in one of the tumbler wrappers and headed back down to the lobby. I appreciated the clerk's friendliness and decided to take another long shot. I slid a hundred-dollar bill across the counter and asked if I could get a copy of the surveillance tape for that floor. Instead of making a copy, he just handed me the original tape and popped a new one into the recorder. I thanked him, he gave me a knowing smile, and I headed home. At home, everything seemed normal. Naturally, I didn't mention anything, and she didn't indicate that anything had happened. I was tempted to ask a few sly questions but decided against it. I wasn't ready to reveal my hand yet. In my mind, I was busy planning my next move. After Marcy went to bed, I quietly reviewed the surveillance tape and discovered who the guy was. Before turning in, I checked the credit card files in the den. The MasterCard bills for the last three months were missing. Marcy usually handled the household bills, and after paying the MasterCard, she would destroy the bills, leaving me with no record of the room rentals. I went to work as usual the next day. The object of Marcy's affection was Kevin Chapman, a middle manager in the company who seemed like an okay guy. I pulled up his personnel records and soon knew everything there was to know about him. I didn't care how or where they met. I just wanted it to be over. Kevin was married with two small children. His wife, Janet, was short with dark hair a bit on the heavy side but still nicely shaped. I had seen her at a few company events and found her attractive, even though she didn't fit the beauty queen mold. Cassie, my secretary, was a bit suspicious of my investigations and mischievously offered any help I might need. It's hard to keep secrets from good secretaries. I asked her to try to get copies of my wife's MasterCard bills and a log of her cell phone calls for the last three months. I had the feeling everyone in the company knew what was going on, except me. Later that day, I found a business card for a female divorce lawyer on my desk. I didn't know where it came from, but
but I put it in my pocket for future reference. At home that night, everything was as usual. I mentioned the company picnic on Saturday, and she said she was looking forward to it. We went to bed at different times, as always, and there was no intimacy, as usual. Friday was a slow day at work. The highlight was that Cassie had obtained the MasterCard records and Marcy's cell phone log. She also had a copy of Kevin's cell phone log. I had never mentioned his name to her. I felt like a fool. Before the end of the day, Cassie suggested that I should try to talk to Janet Chapman at the picnic if possible, and also try to speak with Jake Williamson, the company CEO. She winked as if to say everything would be all right. That night, I watched TV alone while Marcy read a book. My mind was racing. It was time to take action, which brings us back to the picnic. The beer was flowing and everyone was having a great time, except me. Bob Sever, a close colleague, started teasing me about being a party pooper. I tried to joke along, but it didn't go well. I hope you're in a better mood at next year's picnic, Marty, Bob said. I don't think I'll be at next year's picnic, Bob, I replied. That got everyone's attention. What's going on, Marty? Are you leaving the company? He asked. No, I think I'll be in jail this time next year. There was a mix of gasps and giggles at that. Everyone at the table was clamoring for an explanation simultaneously. They couldn't tell if I was joking or serious, but they were all eagerly waiting for an answer. Well, Bob, someone at the company has been sleeping with my wife, and very soon I plan to kill him, his wife, and his kids. I won't tolerate this anymore. Silence fell around the table. Kevin, sitting at the far end, looked visibly disturbed, though I avoided direct eye contact with him. Suddenly, Bill Thomas chimed in. Well, in that case, Marty, can I have your boat? This comment brought laughter from most people, easing the tension a bit. Bill, the boat is worth over ten grand, but you can have it for four thousand. After a brief pause, Bill responded, If you're serious, Marty, it's a deal. Fine, I'll get it cleaned up for you, and you can pick it up tomorrow around noon. Stan, if you still want those ping golf clubs, you can have them for a hundred bucks, okay? Stan Franks nodded and said he'd pick them up on Sunday. Around this time, Kevin got up from the table and walked over to the side of the yard by a bush. I saw him pull out his cell phone and hit a speed dial number. At the same time, across the yard, Marcy was digging in her purse for her phone. They talked briefly, and then Marcy noticed me looking her way and quickly hung up. By the time Kevin returned to the table, I had also sold my truck to a guy in the shipping department. It was turning out to be a good picnic. I was about to call it a night to avoid dampening everyone's fun when I remembered what Cassie had said. I headed over to Jake, who was busy with some important visitors. Not wanting to interrupt, I turned to walk away. Jake grabbed my arm, leaned in, and said, Don't worry, I've got your back. I wasn't sure what he meant, but it sounded reassuring. As I went to tell Marcy I was leaving, Janet, with her two kids, accidentally bumped into me. Before I could say anything, she quickly whispered, We need to talk. I'll call you. Don't call me. I told Marcy I was leaving and that she could either stay and get a ride with someone else or come with me. She chose to leave with me. There was no conversation during the drive home or afterward. I felt very satisfied. The next day, I woke up early, feeling a bit more confident. I took out the golf clubs and cleaned them up a bit for Stan. He knew he got a great deal. I washed the truck, gave it a quick wax, and vacuumed the interior. I didn't need to do it, but it helped distract me from my problems. The boat was a bigger project, so I saved it for last. I figured I could spend the entire morning getting it ready for Bill. While I was outside keeping busy, I could see Marsha constantly on the phone. I'm sure she and Kevin had a lot to discuss. I wished I had thought of a way to record the phone conversations. But then I realized it didn't matter anyway. Stan picked up the clubs, and I went inside to make a sandwich and grab a beer. I spent over an hour with Bill, explaining the boat's wiring and fuel system and loading him up with all the accessories. I made him take all my fishing gear too since I wouldn't need it without a boat. 
It was a busy day. After a quick shower, I got dressed and asked Marcy if she wanted to go out for a bite to eat. She declined without offering any excuse. I found it interesting that she never asked about the boat, the truck, or the golf clubs. It seemed like she was avoiding the subject entirely. That was fine with me. I had a great meal, went to a local bar, and relaxed for the rest of the night. Marcy was asleep when I got home and still in bed when I left for work the next morning. I stopped at the International House of Pancakes on my way to work. It was something I usually didn't do, but I was feeling adventurous. I took my time, read the newspaper, and strolled into work around 10 a.m. Everyone seemed unusually friendly and smiled more than usual. Cassie chuckled and brought me some coffee I didn't need. What's going on? I asked. Well, today you're considered a bit of a celebrity. Your performance at the picnic has spread throughout the company. And that's a good thing? Cassie smiled. Kevin was in very early this morning and asked for an immediate transfer. He didn't provide any explanation, but Mr. Williamson had already informed personnel that if he did come in, they should transfer him to the Baltimore office right away. Kevin cleaned out his desk and was gone within the hour. Damn, I didn't think I was that convincing, but it's kind of funny. Everyone said he looked like a scared rabbit. Cassie said. Did he take his wife and kids with him? I asked. No, he sent them to her parents' place in Maine. I understand she was a bit upset about the whole thing. She said she was going to call me and sounded like it was important. I don't know what to do now. I guess I'll just wait. Things at home were quiet and tense. We only talked when necessary. Marcy never brought up anything that was going on, and neither did I. It was like we were both going out of our way to avoid the topic. I didn't go to bed that night. I just slept on the couch. The next day, I began closing out the credit cards and bank accounts. I was doing everything possible to separate my financial accounts from hers. I left her with one credit card that she had opened in her name alone. I withdrew a thousand dollars in cash and put it in an envelope to give to her when the time came. I closed the checking account and ATM. The Beamer was in her name, but the insurance was in mine, so I canceled the insurance. She had her cell phone, so there was nothing to do there. Just before lunch, Janet called. I met Janet and the kids at a nearby McDonald's. It was her choice, and a good one with the kids. She was extremely angry because Kevin had insisted she go to Maine to stay with her parents without giving her any explanation. She called Kevin's secretary on Monday morning and found out about his transfer. Somehow, it came out that I had threatened to kill Kevin, her, and the kids, and Kevin made her go to Maine to protect her. Janet thought it was nonsense and packed up and came right back home. She asked me if I was going to kill her, and we both laughed. Then, the conversation turned serious. We both know what is going on, she said. I want to know what hard evidence you have to share, and I will tell you what I have, okay? I gave her a genuine smile. I have three months' worth of phone logs for Marcy's and Kevin's cell phones. I also have the credit card records for the rooms they rented at the airport Holiday Inn. There's video footage of them entering and leaving the room, complete with timestamps. And I have three used condoms. Your move. She looked pleased. I can provide voice recordings of several very explicit phone conversations and I have about 40 high-quality photos of them in action. Don't ask how I got them. Additionally, I have an excellent lawyer who is willing to take on both cases if you agree. I left her card on your desk, but you haven't called her yet. I took the card from my pocket and placed it on the table. She smiled again. I actually enjoyed having the kids around, and spending time with Janet was fun, even under these circumstances. We stayed until the kids got tired of playing, then went our separate ways. I agreed to meet with the lawyer, provided she was there too. That afternoon, she brought an envelope with copies of her materials to the office, and I gave her copies of everything I had. We scheduled an appointment with the lawyer for the next morning. The evening at home was uneventful as usual. The attorney was efficient, equipped with checklists and worksheets for every aspect. It seemed like the divorce and settlements would proceed smoothly. I invited Janet for dinner, and she agreed if she could arrange childcare. 
Though I didn't mind the kids joining us, I respected her decision. As I prepared for my date, Marcy remained silent. Offering no explanation, I left for the evening. Our time together was enjoyable, steering clear of discussions about the divorce. She was delightful company, and I escorted her home early, giving her a peck on the cheek. Marcy was already in bed upon my return. The following day, I tackled the backlog of work at the office. Cassie covered for me admirably, but the tasks still needed attention. That evening marked the conclusion of my responsibilities. After dinner, I cleared the kitchen table, laid out some newspaper, and began cleaning my old Army 45. Marcy observed briefly before questioning my actions. What are you doing? she demanded. Without lifting my gaze, I responded, I have some unfinished matters to resolve in Baltimore. What do you mean by unfinished matters? It's personal. She paced back and forth briefly. I don't want you to leave. You're going to do something reckless, and I think you need to consider it. I'm sorry. I have to. Are you worried I'll end up in jail or something? Leaning across the table, her lower lip trembled with anger. I don't care what happens to you. Just don't hurt him. Do you hear me? Don't hurt him. I sat silently, convinced now that I was doing the right thing. She sat down forcefully, leaning towards me. I don't know what you think is going on to make you act so mean, but you need to stop. People are saying you think I'm cheating on you. You have no reason to believe that. So stop being an asshole. I pushed the gun aside, placed my briefcase in front of me, and opened it. Here are your cell phone records for the past three months. Care to guess how many times you called him during that time? And here's a copy of his call log. Guess how often he called you. She leaned back slightly. Cell phone calls mean nothing. I slid the cassette tape across the table to her. Here's a recording of several private phone conversations between you two. Would you like to listen, or are you already aware of their content? She didn't react. I laid out the credit card statements. You even covered the hotel bills. Impressive. Fourteen rooms in three months. Did his spouse know? Her confidence wavered, replaced by escalating frustration. I nudged the VCR tape closer. Here's a video of you and him entering and exiting a motel room, timestamps included. And to cap it off, 40 explicit photos of you both proving my point. I spread the photos out for her to see, ensuring she knew I wasn't bluffing. She glanced at the images. After a moment, she snapped, Okay, okay, enough. You're clouding my thoughts with your accusations. No remorse. No apologies. No fear. Just anger remained. I packed everything into my briefcase, including the gun. She sat motionless. I shrugged on my coat and headed for the door. I'll be spending the night at a motel. By the time I return, I expect you and your belongings to be gone. Anything of yours left behind will be shipped to you. Your Discover card remains active, but the other credit cards have been canceled. Here's a thousand dollars in cash. I suggest using some of it to get car insurance. If you're gone when I return, I won't need to make my trip to Baltimore. I don't want to see you anywhere near this house again. Do you understand? I left the envelope with the cash on the table. Where am I supposed to go? She yelled. Baltimore is lovely this time of year. I chuckled as I left. The next day, Janet and I had lunch. I insisted she bring the kids this time. I enjoyed their company, despite them not being mine. I recounted the previous night's events to her. She tried not to judge, but given the circumstances, it was challenging. After lunch, I drove by the house to ensure Marcy had moved out. She'd left everything tidy, as if she'd never lived there. Later, from work, I called the landlord to inform him I'd be vacating the premises by month's end. It was fine. I didn't need such a large house alone. I began perusing apartment listings in the newspaper. The next day at work, Cassie informed me that Marcy had moved in with Kevin. Though I didn't inquire about her source, I was intrigued. Later, the lawyer called to notify me that the divorce papers for both parties were prepared and would arrive on Saturday morning via messenger. The divorce would be finalized in 90 days, with no anticipated issues. Cassie instructed me to take a 10-day vacation, 
placing a travel agency brochure in front of me. Inside were four plane tickets to Orlando, a week-long stay at a park hotel, and passes for the entire week, courtesy of Jake Williamson. Three months later, the divorce was finalized, and I moved in with Janet, enjoying a wonderful life. Shortly after, Kevin lost his job, burdened with alimony, child support, and car payments, and no source of income. Meanwhile, Marcy began working, only to have her BMW stolen and wrecked, uninsured. Kevin eventually left for a job in Dallas without informing Marcy of his whereabouts. Best of luck to them both.